Ron Rosenbaum, author of Explaining Hitler, and Martin Amos, author of the novel The Zone of Interest, discuss the challenges with writing about topics like the Holocaust. It's about an hour ten. The Zone of Interest is a book that looks to imagine the unimaginable. Could love have taken root at Auschwitz? The book's many fans have called it a tour de force, a masterpiece, a triumph. Even the book's detractors, and there have been a couple, um, have had to pause to acknowledge the book's daring and linguistic inventiveness. Holocaust fiction can make people uneasy. For some, only a just the facts ma'am approach will do. Our museum has always recognized, though, that when it comes to describing the unimaginable, it's often only a first-rate imagination that's up for the task. Martin Amos is the author of 13 previous novels, the memoir Experience, two collections of stories, and six works of nonfiction. He lives in Brooklyn. He'll be joined on stage by Ron Rosenbaum, the author of Explaining Hitler, The Search for the Origin of His Evil, which David Remnick has called a remarkable journey by one of the most original journalists and writers of our time. A newly updated edition with a controversial afterword was published this summer. Both The Zone of Interest and Explaining Hitler will be available in the lobby when our program is through. With that, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Martin Amos and Ron Rosenbaum. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm going to say a few words. Um, and then I have a, a stack of index cards with many questions for Martin. Um, and uh, I want to thank the uh, Museum of Jewish Heritage, which is a uh, wonderful place. And I've been here once before. And maybe I should begin by reminding people. Actually, I probably don't have to remind many people here that last Sunday, November 9th, was the sad 76th anniversary of Kristallnacht, which uh, you all know was the first savage, all Germany safe uh, 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 pogrom against the Jewish people indiscriminately. Many were massacred, 30,000 put into camps. Um, so 76 years, a lifetime away, and yet just yesterday, the uh, news came over the wires that a neo-Nazi group in Germany had uh, demanded the mayor of his town to provide the names and addresses of the Jews uh, in that district. Um, and I don't want to make too much of it in the light of the actual far more alarming and deeper currents of anti-Semitism in Europe. But you know, 76 years, a lifetime, one day, uh, it never really ends. And yet, there is this thing that people have spoken of. The phrase used is Holocaust fatigue. There are so many books, so many uh, histories, so many films, fiction, nonfiction, uh, that many people feel, and I, I myself am, uh, I don't know, guilty of, uh, of this. Uh, when I went to uh, do the updated edition of Explaining Hitler, it was a sense of, uh, oh my god, do I want to enter this abyss again? And Martin has written a novel about the Holocaust in the past. He has returned to it. Um, but for me, this novel of Martin's does a particular service. 
in the light of Holocaust fatigue. Um, it uh, cracks open the carapace of fatigue and takes you into the daily horror of the death camps in a way that, well, you may think you know it, you may not, and then you turn a page in Martin's novel and there's a sort of a, almost a throwaway line uh, or a paragraph or two about the spring meadow at Auschwitz. The spring meadow at Auschwitz was the place where uh, when the crematoria were running over time and uh, couldn't be, uh, the bodies couldn't be completely burned, whatever, uh, uh, they had to be buried, uh, trying to hide the evidence. They buried them in shallow graves under the spring meadow and after a while, this is the thing that uh, got to me, uh, the meadow began to move, it began to quake, it began to steam with the decomposition of the corpses underneath. Now, you know, you know about Auschwitz and you know the six million, et cetera, et cetera, but I didn't anyway know about the Spring Meadow. And throughout this book, there are passages like that. It's not all about that, but it's about the daily life and the, and the, the trap door beneath the daily life that leads to some horrific other level. And so to me, this book was a service in that it illustrated why Holocaust fatigue is, uh, uh, is not the right answer. Um, he also dared to enter a territory that few would want to, uh, which was the horrifying interior of the minds of the perpetrators. Um, and uh, in a time when Holocaust denial was on the increase, when Jews still faced genocidal threats, um, we want to know about the perpetrators. Um, some might say, uh, how dare non-Jews penetrate into this Jewish tragedy? But I would say, how dare non-Jews not seek to find out what it was about non-Jews that led them to do this? I will just close by saying there's one thing that a uh, Holocaust survivor uh, told me, and Martin quotes it also in the uh, afterward of his book, which is, uh, um, you know, there's been some controversy over whether you should seek an explanation for the Holocaust, whether to ask why. And this Auschwitz survivor, Dr. Lewis McKeel, says, there must be a why. We may not find it. Uh, we may never find it. That doesn't mean we should stop seeking it. Anyway, um, maybe I should begin with a, a why question for Martin, which is, why go back again? Was there some inciting moment? Or? Well, the, the, there are, um, by the way, I'd like to thank you for coming and for your uh, courage in facing this issue um, all over again. I, there are many, there are several uh, highly respectable uh, writers and thinkers, among them George Steiner and Cynthia Ozick, uh, who said that the novelist has no business in, in Auschwitz. Um, and under the Arbeit, Arbeit Max Frey, they should read poets and novelists not welcome. We do, you know. Um, but I think the justification is, is, is as broad as it could be, that um, I, anyone who visits and writes about this subject a poet, novelist, historian, philosopher, theologian, um, is there as a body, they're like the teams that investigate plane crashes. Now, uh, the first thing they do when there's a plane crash, if it's on dry land, is to, is to wipe out the logo. It didn't help Pan Am, which was ruined by Lockerbie and never recovered. But then they, then they have a, a deep investigation into what went wrong. And uh, at the end of it, and it may take two or three years, they can say, not that there won't be any more plane crashes, but there won't be any more plane crashes for this reason. Um, this technical fault will not recur. Um, and I think we're all doing that. We're, we're, we're penetrating it so that it doesn't recur. 
um, and that is the broad justification. Um, I think you know, anyone who ventures to go there is, is adding to that effort. Could you describe your visit there or your, what, what was? Um, when I visited Auschwitz and Dachau in around the late 80s, and uh, the most shocking thing for me was that my guide, a young woman, um, said that she has to spend uh, half her time uh, disabusing people who say that the Holocaust never happened and that this is all fa a fabrication. Um, you know, as Christopher Hitchens said memorably, a holo holo Holocaust denier is a Holocaust affirmer, um, or endorser is perhaps better. Um, and there were these uh, neo-Nazi skinheads who, um, they, they don't think it didn't happen. What, they, what they're saying is that they're pleased it happened. Um, so that was my immediate reaction. But it wasn't really a conscious decision to, to go back to write a second novel on this subject. Um, that's not the way novels get born. In fact, if you decide to write a novel about something, it sounds to me like a description of writer's block. It should be um, a more flowing thing coming from your unconscious. Now, what it usually begins, writers talk about a, a frisson or a throb or a shiver. And this is the arrival of something that you can write fiction about. And it could be just an image, it could be a character, possibly a situation. Uh, Nabokov said that he wrote Lolita. He said the first throb of Lolita went through me when I, went, when I saw an article in a French newspaper about a monkey who'd been taught to draw. And they had an example of the monkey's work, and he said, and it, all it showed was the bars of the poor creature's cage. Now, it's a sort of night's move away from Lolita, but that's, in fact, um, what happens in Lolita. He, he, he forces a 12-year-old girl out of her nature, uh, out of her animal nature. And uh, you can read the novel once and even twice without realizing what happens to Lolita at the end of the book, because it's tucked away in the foreword where she's just called Mrs. Richard F. Schiller. Um, and her fate is this. Mrs. Richard F. Schiller died in childbed, giving birth to a stillborn girl in the, in the remote northern settlement of Grey Star. And in a, an afterward that he affixed to Lolita soon afterwards, he said, and Grey Star is the capital of this book. I thought the, uh, your decision to situate the novel at a, a a specific time in the history of Auschwitz and the history of the war was kind of interesting. You want to describe that? It was when, it was right after Stalingrad. What did that mean for the people at Auschwitz? Well, it was during, it starts in the summer of 42. And that, by the way, all I had when I began is, is the contents of the first page, which is a sort of love at first sight moment against this violently anomalous background. Um, that's what I began with. Um, but it was very important to... It, it, uh, the summer of 42 suggested itself to me because that's when the war really turned against Germany. In fact, the war was, was lost for Germany in December 41 when, as the Wehrmacht war diary records, the, the Führer has acknowledged that no victory in the East can, can any more be won. And then four days later, he declared war on the USA. So he had war on two fronts. On one front, the USSR. On the other, uh, not only the British Empire, but uh, the USA. So, um, so the, the and then people becomes, at Auschwitz knew that they were going to lose the war and started to hide the evidence. I thought that was a... Uh, is, is that, am I correct in yes, saying? Yes, that's right. Um, when they, they were told to exhume throughout and all the Reinhardt camps as well, the Belzec, Treblinka, Sobibor, etc., cetera, um, that they were to exhume the buried bodies and, uh, and burn them. And uh, 
uh, my character says the, the, the Lagerfuhrer of, of, of Auschwitz, which is never named, says, why are we getting all namby-pamby about it now? He said, we're going to have to be doing a lot more of this, aren't we? The gypsies, the Slavs. But um, a, a clear tremor of impending defeat. And they suddenly realized that the huge scale of their gamble on victory and these crimes that they legalized uh, were still illegal everywhere else. Um, and when they started exhuming the bodies, they had no idea how many there were. And they decided that uh, to count the skulls uh, wouldn't do it because they had all, most of them been shot in the back of the neck and the skulls often were shattered. So they counted up the number of femurs, hip bones, and divided by two. And there, was, there were 107,000 bodies in, in that spring meadow. Uh, that's after dividing by two. Um, and uh, all, all through So the they had no reason to keep killing because they knew already they lost the, they were going to lose the war. If they were ever caught, they would be probably hanged for war crimes. Yes. Um, and yet they kept killing. It, it's, a, it's a great mystery, and you, you write about it too, um, that the war's lost in December 41, and, and Sebastian Hafner, that popular German historian, argues very strongly that um, it, was all, it became pure self-destruction after that and that Hitler began to covet defeat and wanted that defeat to be as, as total and as uh, humiliating as possible. Uh, Hitler had turned against another population, the Germans, um, and his, his tactics towards the end of the war can only uh, vouch for the fact that he wanted the Russians to come in first. His last He push. wanted the Russians to punish the German people for their, yeah, he for wanted, their lack of uh, devotion to his grand dream. Yeah, and not being up to it, you know, stronger people. But he wanted, he wanted what actually happened, which was, um, you know, a lot of murder and rape. That Republican senator who said that uh, when women are raped, their reproductive mechanisms uh, switch themselves off might be intrigued to learn that there were a million illegitimate births uh, in, um, in Germany uh, thanks to the Red Army. It was an, it was an army of rapists and a, a whole population sprang up. It's it. tragedy upon tragedy. Um, since we, we mentioned uh, Hitler, you don't mention him in the novel. You, occasionally someone will call him the great deliverer. But you do have, at the end of the book, a full-page photo of Hitler looking really strange. And Hitler used to vary his mustache designs. Uh, and this is one of the weirdest looking mustaches he's ever had. It looks had. like a, a mustache made out of nostril hairs. Yeah. It? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, well, uh, he's with Borman. And he looks so loutish, I thought, in that photograph. He looks like such a thug and a gutter snipe, which uh -huh. is what he was. Um, we mustn't forget that the, the mystery is, is twofold. There's the Hitler mystery, um, you know, Ron's book explaining Hitler. Um, you, at one point you say it's, you can't even imagine a new piece of evidence that would actually um, explain his hatred. Um, and Primo Levi um, says that, in fact, one must not understand it, that it's your duty not to understand it. Because if you understand something, you, can, you include it within yourself, you contain it, you even identify with the perpetrator. And he said, and no one can do that. Um, so, and he says, there is no rationality in the German hatred, um, it is a, it is, anti-human, really counter-human. Um, it is a hatred that is not in us. It is outside man. Um, which for me was, I'd been so frustrated by the fact that I'd read scores of books over 25 years 
and uh, I realized, I reread Martin Gilbert's The Holocaust in a paperback edition, and I made my usual marks in the margin. And then I looked at my, the original, the hardback, which I'd read first, and the, my marks were all the same. Exclamation marks at exactly the same point. Um, and I realized that my incredulity was um, intact and entire, that I'm, I'd gained in knowledge, but not at all in penetration. And when I read those, that in self interview by Primo Levi, the, the pressure of the why lifted, and I didn't feel frustrated by that anymore. Um, and this does tend to, to argue that it, there was something verging on the supernatural. That's what I was uh, wondering about. Yes, your epi uh, epigraph is from Macbeth, and uh, there are times in the novel when, there are some times when you talk about the commandants at Auschwitz as uh, uh, psychopathic, criminally insane, or, uh, or the Germans anyway, and, and then there are some times uh, in which you seem to suggest the presence of an unseen, darker world of the almost supernatural. Uh, are you divided on this question? Or? Well, I'm, I don't believe it was a supernatural event because I don't believe in the supernatural. But, um, but uh, diarists of the time, um, von Molke and um, Friedrich Reck said that both used the phrase outside history or beyond history that there was a real tear, a rip in history. And I do think something like that happened. I, years and years ago, I was um, interviewing Anthony Burgess, the author of A Clockwork Orange and other books. And um, he said, there is, there is no AJP Taylorish explanation for what happened there. AJP Taylor being a sort of classic utilitarian historian. And um, Burgess, who was a Catholic, said, I do believe in evil, and I think it manifested itself in Eastern Europe between 1941 and 1945. Um, but I, I don't believe in evil as a disembodied force. What I do believe in is that, that death gets going. Death suddenly is up and running and can be a tremendously powerful force, as we're seeing now in, in Iraq and Syria, um, that it, it gets its own momentum. Um, and, you know, it's a commonplace to say that after the Russian Revolution, the value of life collapsed in the Soviet Union. And it certainly collapsed in Eastern Europe in, in, in the uh, later, 30 years later. But um, <coughs> it, it was more than the collapse of the value of human life. It was more like the, the death took on a value. Um, I, I like the phrase, death got up and running. It's a very Emesian uh, <laughs> kind of... Uh, when it, uh, it did, it sort of, it, when you think how Hitler attacked life wherever he saw it, um, sterilizations, um, castrations, forced abortions, and euthanasia, um, the, the ill, the old, the, the very young, um, the, the useless mouths. It was, a, it was a sort of a cult of death. What, uh, when you say a cult of death, is, was it a cult of one? You mentioned Hitler is the only, you, you talk about Hitler's fever dream and distinguish it in a way from the guilt and complicity of those in the death camps, um, or do you? Uh, well, I think the mystery is, is twofold. Um, there's, on the one hand, Hitler, the, the only major historical figure that no historian claims to understand. In fact, most historians make a point of saying they don't understand it. And Alan Bullock says, the more I learn, the, the harder I find it to explain. Um, and, you know, why did he, it was also a, a great mystery of, of the German people. Um, surely a great mark of exceptionalism is that the, the, the most highly educated country that ever been on earth uh, turned into this, um, you know, absolutely purulent force for wickedness. Um, he, Hitler was an Austrian tramp. 
uh, whose education ended when he was 17. He was barely literate. I've seen recently that book, Hitler's Library, where he, he was making sort of elementary spelling mistakes well into his 20s. Um, he, and, and yet, he somehow, and this is, this is the only area where I see a way forward, he somehow identified, the, Ameri uh, the, the German people identified with him. He sort of made, uh, what was he, a failure? He failed as an artist, he, then he became a, a tramp in a men's home in Vienna. He failed, he, in the army, he was very brave and he, he was a runner. Um, and one officer called him a, a completely intolerable um, fault finder and grumbler and know all. Um, and yet, and he never advanced beyond the rank of corporal. After four years and two iron crosses, um, couldn't be trusted as a sergeant. Um, and then uh, sort of emerged as this fringe politician who frequently foamed at the mouth when he talked and was responsible for how many polit political murders, do we think? Every Hundred, day, hundreds of... Uh, every day in the Munich Post were one, two, three political murders attributable to Hitler. And how did this man, in the whole history of Weimar, no party ever got 37% as the National Socialists did. Um, how did he unify a country behind failure? This is... This is the there is this real gap between the failure who comes out of the army and two or three years later he's this charismatic, foaming at the mouth, yet highly effective uh, leader of a party that uh, becomes a head of 50 million, a nation of 50 million. It's, uh, there's, it's one of the most frustrating things uh, and no theory has really crossed that gap. No, and, um, and the Austrian phenomenon is uh, that uh, with a population barely a tenth of, of Germany, it nonetheless supplied half the, uh, the concentration camp personnel. Um, the, the Germans said of the Austrians, you know, they were never really very good Nazis, but, but they were certainly good anti-Semites. Huh. Um, you know, he took his hat off to them for that. Um, this is just as pressing a mystery, I think, as, as Hitler's personal motivation. No one can figure out whether he picked up his anti-Semitism in Austria or because uh, he doesn't seem to have manifested it in the army or, uh, but maybe he did. Um, well, there's a um, very interesting conversation when, when we talk about the intentionalists and the functionalists and interpretations of, of the Holocaust. Um, he had a conversation with a man with the marvelous name of Major Hell, Joseph <laughs> Hell, uh, yes. in 1922. And uh, Hitler said, um, we're going to do this in every city in Germany. We're going to string them up, uh, the Jews, and when they start to rot, we'll let them rot for a bit, and then we'll cut them down and then do another batch. Um, no one will protect them, etc. cetera. Um, now, that means that he was fantasizing about, um, and in my camp, he said, if we gassed several thousand of these gentlemen, uh, the, the November, yes, the, the November uh, criminals. The presage of uh, extermination is, is there, it's but there. it's so sudden and so violent, out of uh, nowhere. Um, well, he couldn't have done it without the war in the East. And, yes. and that may, may even be why he attacked Russia. You know, the first rule of warfare, as everyone knew, is never invade Russia. <laughs> um, it's true that Germany did it in the first war, but that was an old-style cabinet war, that it wasn't this murderous, you know, Vernichtungskrieg um, undertaken by Hitler. And what happens when you, you do that is that you're not just dealing with the Red Army, you're dealing with every Russian. Man, woman, and child is your enemy. Um, and nonetheless, that's what he did, and perhaps just so that he could have the cover, the sort of fog, 
to, to get this project done. That his main project was, I, I think both you and I have mentioned this, uh, the war against the Jews rather that was more important to him in a way than any other war he was fighting. I know, and um, his last will, his last testament, um, he says that, uh, you know, the eternal enemy of mankind, the Jew, and it's true that we did kill a lot of Jews by the relatively humane means. Uh, but it, it, that was his sort of last shriek from the bunker. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the horrible reality is that instead of when he, the war was clearly lost, December 41, um, instead of uh, retreating from this genocide, he, he embraced it all the more energetically. And he thought it, it, this was one war aim he could bring off. Forget about Lebensraum and the, in making the Reich last for a thousand years, all that. No, just, just the extermination of the Jews. And he thought that, um, that, that posterity would, would thank him for this. He won that war in a way. Yes, he um, did. Just a shift for a moment back to your novel. Um, has, has anyone else done this, written a, a novel from the point of view of the death camp commandants and personnel? Um, I haven't read much Holocaust fiction. I read um, The Kindly Ones, that huge book by Jonathan Littell, um, which is, has got some incredibly powerful things in it, but is, as a novel is very out of shape. It's not coherent in the way a novel needs to be. Um, and he, he goes, he, I don't think he enters the voice of a, of a, a perpetrator. And his, his figure, his main figure, is, is rather ambiguous and drifts around. Um, so I don't know if it's been done before. What were your main challenge? It seems like the most incredibly difficult task. Your, your challenge in giving these people an interiority. Well, it, it was made much easier by the fact that um, the, the commandant of Auschwitz, and I enter his thoughts, he's one of the th three main characters, um, he wrote a book in his death cell in Poland um, in 1945, 1946, before he was hanged at Auschwitz. And he, in the Primo Levi, Levi writes an introduction to this book, and he says, on the first paragraph, he says, despite his efforts to defend himself, he comes across as what he is, a coarse, a stupid, l pompous, long-winded scoundrel. And um, you read these pages, and it's almost like a great novel by someone like Nabokov. You know, he, this is a narration by someone with zero self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and Nabokov has, has written two or three novels um, where, where this is comically the case, where someone doesn't understand what's going on. Um, so that was a, a great help to me um, because there are his thoughts. And um, it's not so much, you know, the banality of evil is a phrase that uh, we're not happy with, I think, you and I. Um, and I think Robert J. Lifton got it right when he said, uh, they may have been banal before it all began, but they weren't banal once they started doing it. Um, you lost your banality very quickly when you were in this atrocity-producing situation. Um, but I, it was, it's so clear from his memoir that um, this was just a task and an unpleasant one, and no one's going to thank me for it. And you know, Like Himmler saying, this is a glorious page in our history that we can never acknowledge. Um, they, they honestly thought that, uh, that serious anti-Semitism, as they said, I, science, scientific, I pseudo-scientific anti-Semitism, was um, you know, a, a, a plank of their ideology and it was something they passionately believed in. Yeah, on this subject, um, before I got to read your novel, I uh, 
had done an afterward for explaining Hitler, in, uh, in which I talked about the uh, feel-good Holocaust genre, in which uh, uh, there are certain films, most notable, like Life is Beautiful, the uh, Benigni movie, uh, in which you're supposed to come away from a movie about the Holocaust feeling sort of human, uplift, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was concerned uh, that when I heard there was going to be a love story there, but you were very careful in your handling of, of this. Uh, well, I, I do think um, there are responsibilities attached to, to writing a novel on this subject. Um, but it, it, I didn't find it qualitatively different from any other sort of challenge in a in fictional challenge. It's always the same thing. What you're doing 100 times per page is try to find the words to fit exactly the tone and the content of what you're saying. And um, the pressures on you are much sharper when you're dealing with um, an event like the Holocaust but they're not unfamiliar to me. And the, the same challenge I fa faced when I wrote about a young criminal who wins, the, wins uh, the lottery in the novel before. It was just finding the tone. You have uh, Hannah, who is perhaps, I guess, the most clear-sighted person in the novel, who said, nothing good must come out of this. And ultimately, the love story is, uh, uh, it's her decision, in a way, to uh, that whatever her feelings, she just can't be responsible for. Yeah, I almost had her say, say uh, she said it would be just, think how disgusting it would be if anything good came out of that place. And I did, was going to have her say, we're not French. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, it, it, I, I wasn't sure how to end it. And then I, I thought, okay, it can't be. A, a positive ending. It just it, that would be indecorous in the in the literary sense, not not just in the politesse sense. That it had to be. Um, it's very important that they do. There's never any more, anything more than a kiss on the cheek and a hug in the whole book between these two people. But but they are very, uh, you know passionately aware of each other and support each other in Auschwitz. She's the wife of the commandant and he's the nephew of Martin Bormann. So he's, he's quite, uh, he's a scion of the new order. Um, but but n there is no, nothing more than, than warm feeling. And uh, as he says, and this I took from Sebastian Hafner's third book on this subject, Defying Hitler, is that when, when, when Hitler picked up the keys to the chancellery, all, all sane Germans felt not just horror, but a complete sense of unreality. Um, the world just looked as ersatz, fake. Um, and then what happens to you is as the public space and pressure increases, the private space decreases. And um, all your finer feelings, all, um, all your sensitivity, all your imaginative sympathy um, has to shrink. They call themselves internal exiles. You, you went on an exile into yourself. And the, the sort of key bit in the, in the novel is when he, he's been trying to seduce this woman from a distance. But then he, he comes to a little gazebo at the very edge of the zone of interest, as they co call the whole area. And uh, he enters, and there she is, and she's asleep. And for an hour, he watches her sleeping and feels all those fine feelings that he's dismissed. And, and Sebastian Hafner said, You're, in fact, it's a relief to be rid of those feelings. And you think, no, let it go. Let it go, let that feeling go. And that you say, what, even that feeling? Yes, let it go. You freed yourself from all scruple and all self-examination. But as he watches her sleep, he, he feels it all coming back. And that is the sort of emotional heart of the book, just that one hour. 
Um, it's uh, interesting that uh, I, I thought an interesting uh, aspect of the book was the uh, British propaganda broadcasts that uh, posed as a German soap opera uh, until the very Gert and Willi. Gert, yeah, and uh, Willi, they, they all seem to be, uh, you know, it's very subtly done, uh, except at the end, Willi comes out and says, every German is implicit, uh, impl implicated in the greatest mass murder of history. Do um, you feel that's the case? Well, that, that, that was an actual transcript I really? used. I mean, I, I changed a couple of things, but that was, yeah, and it was, it's extraordinary, um, the history of the revelation of the Holocaust. It, it was first published in the Boston Globe, I think June 26th, 1942. Um, saying uh, massacre in the East goes beyond 700,000. Um, and that was at the bottom of page 12. Uh, the New York Times picked it up the next day and the, the, art, the article was two inches long uh, and was an addendum to uh, just a, a routine piece about uh, cruelty in Poland. Um, and, and then it, it sort of built up from there. But um, the, the, the Germans knew they couldn't keep it secret because of the- They knew what? They couldn't keep it secret because of the, the sheer scale. Uh, so it, there was, I think that year, there was a, a three minute silence in the House of Commons in London for the murdered Jews. Um, it, yes, I, I think you have, uh, one of your uh, most fascinating characters, Shmuel, uh, the uh, Sonder, uh, who says, oh, whatever we could do, uh, who would care? The world wouldn't care. Was that what he, he Well, he, he says the, the world must know. And, um, well, this is a, a desperate irony, but um, anti-Semitism in America peaked in precisely the years when the Holocaust was, that was being completed, 1941 to 1945. Um, every synagogue in Crown Heights, is it, was um, defiled, swastikas daubed on holy books, um, lots of beatings, no deaths, lot, lots of beatings, often of Jewish children. Um, and it, it it came to a head in those years and then was, is in retreat. I mean, anti-Semitism is, is, uh, is in itself um, inexplicable, I think. Um, I was gonna ask you that. Do you have any theories about, I mean, at uh, one point, the, uh, the idiot wife of uh, Martin Bormann, uh, who thinks the Jews really hate the Germans and that's why everything terrible happened. She says, why do they hate us so much? But, Really, you're asking, why do people hate the Jews so much? Well, it, it, anti-Semitism, it, it, it can be likened, I think, to a sort of virus that, um, is, that becomes viral um, every now and then. There was a fascinating report by the Anti-Defamation -Defam League uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I recommend you Google it, because it's a world map, and it's uh, showing levels of anti-Semitism in every country. And uh, it was done by presenting thousands of citizens with a list of propositions that only an anti-Semite would accede to. Things like they're, they're not loyal to the countries of origin, they only look out for themselves, etc. cetera. They, they run uh, Wall Street and the Bourse and et cetera. And the figures are, are really uh, stunning the highest in Europe, second highest in Europe is France with 37%. Uh, the highest is Greece with 69%. And of course in Iraq it's 94%. Um, and the most lenient of the Middle Eastern countries is Iran with a mere 55%. Um, England is, is, Britain is 8%, which is still twice as high as uh, Sweden. 
And America, impressively, is 9%. And Canada is uh, 20%. Um, and all the South American countries uh, hover around 30, 40%. Um, it's ineradicable, I think. S someone called it the egalitarianism of fools, uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, it's a revolt against a level playing ground. Um, if you look at the list of winners of the Nobel Prize, all the prizes, it's, it's undeniable that the Jews have a huge proportion compared to their numbers. Um, for all sorts of historical reasons, they are very talented and resourceful people. And uh, I think, you know, envy is, uh, is as much to do with it as anything else. And the fact that it's, uh, it's as prevalent in the Islamic world as it is in the Christian world, uh, Christopher Hitchens ha ha had a brilliant explanation for that, I think, where he says that, um, you know, Christ came and n never mind about the Christ killer stuff, but um, Christ came and the, and the Jews weren't interested. He said, no thanks. You know. George Steiner wrote an essay about that and said uh, the Jews refuse Jesus because they're the children of Eve. They want to uh, believe that uh, they're, they're, they're curious. They don't want the story to have an ending. Um. <laughs> and, and when the same thing happened when Muhammad appeared. Um, you know, all monotheisms are very uh, savage about those who don't believe, who don't follow the prophet. Um, but the Jews, not impressed by Muhammad, not interested. So he, the Jews rejected both Christ and Muhammad, and that's, you don't get forgiven for that. But picky, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let me ask you a question about uh, uh, your, your own work, which is, some say, is divided into uh, a comic, satiric side and a, a very serious side. I, I'm a great admirer of uh, the, uh, your comic novels, Money, The Information, um, and London Fields in particular, I think are just brilliant. and. Uh, can read them over and over again. And then you also have uh, devoted yourself to novels and nonfiction about Hitler and Stalin, where uh, the payoff is not guaranteed, the territory is fraught. Uh, is there is there some unity between your comic satiric side and your? Um, well, I hate it when people say this is a comedy. Um, it, it, because when we think of laughter, we always think of you know tittering. High, yeah, no, I wasn't spirited. referring to this at all. No, um, but I think there, there is a great, there's a good deal of humor in this book, but it's satirical, not comic. It's fiercer than that. Um, because, you know, when you talk forever about the evil and the wickedness and baseness and the squalor of it all, but also the, the, the stupidity of it, and, um, and that it was a ridiculous project. Um, so satirical humor, I think, has its place. Um, but I think it all goes back to the fact that I was born in 1949, uh, four years after the death of the little moustache, and four years before the death of the big moustache. Uh, the big moustache was still known as Uncle Joe in the tabloid paper we took at, at home. Um, and I, I said to my mother one day, I, I, I was sort of troubled, and I said, um, I'd just seen some photographs of, not, not very explicit, but, but of the smokestacks and the rail tracks. And, um, and I said, I said, Mom, what was all that about Hitler and, and the, all those starving people? And she said very typically, she said, um, oh, don't worry about Hitler. She said, um, you've got blonde hair and blue eyes. Hitler would have loved you. <laughs> and I felt sort of ignoble relief. I sort of slunk away thinking, phew. Um, 
But I think that sort of brewed something in me. And um, those two figures uh, uh, just sort of have been hovering around my life, and I can't seem to um, get clear of them. What do you think of the, uh, there's a, a kind of new controversy about uh, Hitler and Stalin and comparative evil and uh, Timothy Snyder's book, Bloodlands, which sort of says that Stalin was equally genocidal. Um, do you feel that there's any point in, uh, in this competition or is, is Hitler in some way set apart from Stalin? Well, I think he is in this sense. Um, I mean, the, the crime, hit, the Stalin crime that most neatly corresponds to the Holocaust is the terror famine in the Ukraine of 1933, where it's not known, but something like seven, eight, nine million peasants were starved to death, even though the granaries were full. This was, um, and Vasily Grossman wrote a novel that dealt with this, and. Um, the descriptions of what it's like to watch your family starving to death uh, matches in cruelty the Holocaust, I think, comparable. Um, and he says, you know, some mothers ran away from their children, uh, some mothers ate their children, uh, and some mothers were, were loving right to the very last gasp and told their children stories and tried to just ease them through it. Um, so, you know, very comparable with the Holocaust, but the difference is that, um, that Stalin really had no choice. Uh, he, his intention was to break the peasantry uh, and collectivize them. And um, if, he, if he decided on something a bit more sort of Bukharin-like, it would have been uh, abandoning the, social, the socialist experiment and betraying the revolution. So he had to go forward. He had to be as hard as nails to get that through. Whereas there's no conceivable ideological justification for what Hitler did. It wasn't, Sebastian Hafner again says it wasn't an ideology. I mean, what, what did he have? Lebensraum. Uh, he wanted the Reich to last for a thousand years. Uh, what else is there? anti-Semitism. Um, and he said what, what Hitlerism was, was really just a rallying cry for sadists. For sadists. He's saying if, if you can beat and kill and steal for no reason and without provocation, then come to my banner. Um, and that's how he uh, recruited his rank and file. Um, it, it's, it makes no sense. Uh, as a, as a war aim or anything else. Which puts him in a different category. Yeah, well, just, just uh, again, outside history. I mean, in Germany, there was the great controversy of the 80s and 90s where they tried to relativize Hitler and say that it wasn't so very different from, that he learned it all from Stalin and Lenin, um, that it was a continuum, you know. Um, and they even asked us to consider in the same category, the Allied bombing of Germany, um, in which, by the way, thousands of uh, airmen died. So it wasn't like the Holocaust in that it was a huge risk to yourself that you undertook this. Um, and as Churchill said, surely rightly, he said, it's the moral rot of war. Um, the bigger they are, the faster they age wars. And uh, it, it, by the end of it, every protagonist is, uh, is sort of fizzing with a sort of madness. Um, Gabriel, do you, uh, should we do a Q&A at this point? Uh, yes. OK. Uh, so uh, in the, in the Q&A, could I just plead that people ask questions rather than statements, just so it's fair to everyone. They'll have more time to ask their questions, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, someone, go ahead. We just have, we're going to bring a microphone to you just so the question can be recorded. Uh, you talk about Holocaust fatigue. 
How would you explain that there is Holocaust fatigue, but at the same time, there is this fascination with evil? Books about the Nazis sell. I mean, it's like they want to know every single day what happened. Um, well, I, I don't feel Holocaust fatigue. Um, in fact, I agree with W.G. Sebald, who said that um, no serious person ever thinks about anything else. Um, you know, you do think about your lunch and your dinner and your children and all that, but, um, but it's because it's su such a mystery, um, the, the fascination is infinite, I think. Um, I never feel the slightest bit of fatigue. Um, and, I think the fatigue maybe masks fear in a way of facing yeah. once again these facts which are not going to change uh, and are only going to get worse the more we know. Next question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, wait one second. Oh, I'm so loud. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about, you know, you reminded me of the Eddie Izzard joke that Hitler obviously never played Risk as a kid when he was you know, going into Russia. Um, I want to ask about that. I mean, that was such a, a horrifying miscalculation and such an awful period of the war. What motivation besides providing a kind of cloud of cover could there have been for that debacle? Well, um, the pseudo-scientific um, anti-Semitism was enough because, uh, you know, people who don't like African Americans don't suspect them of taking over the world. That is the, the, the peculiarity of anti-Semitism. So they were, they were not only uh, running the Bank of England and Wall Street, but they were also in the Kremlin. Um, whereas, in fact, um, the Soviet Union was uh, after Lenin's death, he said anti-Semitism is counter-revolution, he said tersely, uh, because it, it was a czarist notion, the pogrom, the protocols of the Elders of Zion, you know, it was a, a Russian um, fabrication, not a forgery, as it's often called, a fabrication, whistled out of thin air by the Akrana, the secret police. So he, he, he wrote, Hitler wrote a long letter to uh, Mussolini whom he hadn't told about this, um, but he said, I have attacked Russia and I feel so much easier in my soul now that um, I'm going after the real enemy. So he, he, they did think, and everyone thought, including Churchill, including Roosevelt, thought that Russia would collapse, um, that the whole rotten structure would reveal itself in, a, in just a few months. But um, but when, when you come into a country and you don't just have pitch battles in the, in the classical style, you, you, you start killing huge numbers of people, then, then the whole country sort of regurgitates you. And um, as soon as perhaps we are, uh, there was a spy in, in Tokyo who said, you needn't worry about an attack from Japan in the East because they're, they're going to be busy with their own uh, little empire there. So he, with the Wehrmacht on the outskirts of Moscow, suddenly there were you know, dozens of divisions that were freed up from the East and they arrived and made the difference. So um, it, it was a, a crazed miscalculation, but he thought he was, that was his real enemy, uh, the Jews in the Kremlin. But, but after, after Lenin, uh, the Soviet Union was very anti-Semitic itself, and only Stalin's death prevented um, another Holocaust for the Jews in, in Russia. I think there were two and a half million of them by then, and they were going to have to run the gauntlet, the press full of violent anti-Semitism. Uh, they're going to have to run the gauntlet to the North Chinese border where um, a little settlement had, in this wisely uninhabited part of Russia was being set up for them. Uh, <coughs> so the idea that, that you know, they were all Trotsky, they were all Jews in the, in the Kremlin, was just completely false. 
Yes. What was the relationship between, was Hitler an end product of the Enlightenment? I just discovered, I didn't know it, and I'm French, that Voltaire was extremely anti-Semitic, I just read. We can't necessarily see it because the versions of his writing have been uh, changed through the centuries, but if you read the original in the 18th century, it's just uh, like Gobineau. And my second question is, so was he a result of the Enlightenment or was he rejecting it? And same question for his relationship with religions. Religions? Yes. Well, he, he, he certainly um, spat in the face of the Enlightenment. Um, it was, he definitely wanted to reverse that process. Uh, he wanted a benighted land, not an enlightened one. Uh, there was a, a huge argument through the first half of the 20th century in Germany about whether they should lean to the West or lean to the East. Um, the West meant democracy, meant you know, uh, Europe, and the East was a mystical idea. It was called a, between civilization and culture. Civilization was the West, culture was the East, sort of Tartary. Um, and it, um, as has been said, you know, another reason why we can distinguish it from, uh, from Stalinism is that uh, sooner or later a country was going to try a socialist experiment. Um, there was just too much Marx, Karl Marx in the air. Um, someone was going to try it. And uh, it was uh, inevitable that the experiment would be undertaken. Not that it would be so dynamic and horrific, but that someone was going to try it. Whether the, and there's no reason, nothing inevitable at all about national socialism. Um, in, in fact, if, uh, if Hitler had a little bit more talent, um, you, could see, you could see him being a sort of sexually ambiguous uh, painter living in Linz or um, in Vienna and doing quite well, and, and this would never have happened. Um, yes? Was there a problem uh, in publishing the book in, in Germany? Um, publishing it in Germany. Yes, there was, and in France too. I mean, it's since been resolved in both cases. Um, but I was, I was very surprised, more by Germany than by France, um, because last time I was in Germany, I was impressed by, my publisher said, what are you going to talk about at these events? And I said, mm, um, I said, I could talk about the Holocaust, but they're not going to want to hear about that, are they? And she said, oh yes, they are. And I, um, the a whole stratum, people on, between the ages of sort of 20 and 35, uh, really hungry to know about the Holocaust, um, to air it, to, you know, it, it typically takes several generations and 50 years to for even country like Switzerland, that everyone thinks of as being clean, in fact had a disgraceful war and uh, profited from the Aryanization of Jewish businesses and had, did huge, um, <coughs> huge business of the jewels that were taken from the Jews uh, at Auschwitz and elsewhere, and they were all, all sort of laundered in Switzerland. Um, so you, you, you know, France hasn't begun this journey, but <clears throat> I mean, Chirac did say that on the anniversary of the roundup in Paris, this, this was a period of shame for our country. We dishonored France in those years. Um, but as I said, you know, still 37% anti-Semites. Um, but Germany has done the work uh, the hard and nauseous work of coming to terms with the crimes of their uh, ancestors. Um, so I was, I was surprised that, I mean, in, in my opinion, 
publishers turn things down uh, only because they think they're not going to do well with them. I don't think it's, uh, it speaks of uh, a national sensitivity. I think it just speaks of uh, the profit motive in that particular publishing house. Yes. Can I just say it? Or should I just say it? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, so I, I miss Christopher Hitchens reading him all the time, and I know you say you spent years thinking and writing about this, and so I kind of wonder what sort of airtime you two gave this topic, and if there was any particular insight from him that you could share that, that resonated with you. Yeah, no, we talked about it all the time. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if we ever, you know, penetrated it, um, but we did agree that that uh, Gregor Strasser, the confederate of Hitler's, who broke with him, said was asked, I think, in the late twenties, what what would National Socialism uh, be if we had it, and he said it would be the opposite of what exists today. Um, and it, it was, in the end, the opposite of what being human is. Um, and I, we felt that, um, uh, what, what, what was the word he, Christopher used? Um, antithetalism was a sort of basis of na national socialism. What was that word? Antitheticalism, uh -huh. where you go against all the norms. Um, and that certainly seems to be what happened. This may have to be the last question. Moving on a little closer to today, uh, I was very intrigued by your metaphor about regurgitation of, uh, of your enemies. If the, you, the, the what, sorry? The, I was in, your metaphor about regurgitating an enemy, like in Russia, the Russians regurgitated the Germans. Do you see, considering that um, anti-Semitism is certainly very much at the genesis of uh, ISIS, and what's going on in the Middle East today. Do you see a parallel between that and what happened during World War II? Um, no, because, I mean, not, not a close parallel, because um, uh, World War II was fought between great powers. Um, and it was, it was uh, you know, stumbled into not, not like the First World War. It was a response to uh, the incredible aggression and uh, mendacity of Hitler um, and I expansionism. Um, I don't think there's any mystery about uh, you know, the, the, uh, why people fought. In fact, you know, when you read history, you're always thinking to yourself, in a, in a kind of sub-vocal way, you're thinking, what would I have done? And um, I, that's one moment where I know very well what I would have done, which was sign up, uh, 1939, September 1939, w without any hesitation at all. Um, so it, it did have that momentum behind it, that it was just. I guess on that note, we'll uh, say thank you for coming, and uh, I hope it uh, worked out to your satisfaction. I'd like to thank both of our speakers uh, for this thoughtful and wide-ranging conversation, and both their books will be available in the lobby. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>